Hi, I'm Drew from Drew Web Wild. I'm a professional wildlife filmmaker. Today, I've traveled to the Yorkshire Dales because I specialize in British wildlife and I'm looking for two iconic British species today. The first being the endangered red squirrel, the second being the white-throated dipper. So I've traveled up to the Yorkshire Dales to visit Paul Fowley's wildlife hides where he's guaranteeing me I can see some red squirrels, but we'll see how it goes. And my second species that I'm looking for today is the dipper. Now that I'm gonna to have to travel a little bit away from, so depending on how much light I have left will depend on if I actually get them. But hopefully I'll be able to see some dippers down at the river. So what I'm gonna do is walk you through how I make my YouTube films and how I make my wildlife films in general. I'm gonna give you a few secrets as to how I get my audio recordings and how I also get the shots that everybody looks for. Okay, so as a wildlife filmmaker, you may be wondering what's inside my backpack. So I'm just gonna walk you through now. At the very bottom of the bag, I've got a Sony 70-200 and. I'm sure I'm going to use that a lot today. It's got that kind of mid focal length. It's not quite super telly. It's in the middle there, which gives you some nice close up shots. And the 2.8 aperture is brilliant for low light. Just above that, we've got the 200 to 600, which is the one for further subjects away. It's a much higher aperture. It's the 5.6. So in low light situations, it can be kind of a bit of a hindrance, but there are some situations, especially with things like birds in flight, where you really do need this lens and the compression you get from this lens is second to none. So this is the Portkeys PT5 II, which is a field monitor. It's actually loaded with all of my editing LUTs. So what I can do with this is place it on top of the camera and I can see how the image is going to come out color graded before and whilst I'm shooting. So I can speed up my editing workflow. It makes my life so much easier. It also gives me a much larger field of view than the little screens you get on the back of the camera. So it's really useful to have. And to go with that, you need these, uh, well, I think there were Sony once upon a time. These ones are actually the um, Godox ones, but they're MPF batteries and they're just charged up with USB-C. Moving up, we're now on to cameras. First one we have is the FX3, which is really great for low light. If you want a low light beast, the FX3 is the one, especially if you're shooting things like owls, anything that's in the dark in today in the woodlands, I'm sure I'm gonna use this. And above that, we have the new Sony FX30. Now, this one has the APS-C sensor or the Super 35 sensor. It's a crop sensor, essentially, which means you get a 1.5 booster to any lens you've got. So that gives me much more reach on my 7200, much more reach on my 600. And that's gonna really come in useful for those super close ups. I want some things of like squirrels, hands, feet, chewing on those uh, hazelnuts. That's what I want today. Moving across, we have the DJI Mini 3 Pro. It gets me some establishing shots, really useful for filmmaking. Helps me to set the scene and also bridges some things. So when you're making films, you'll find that a lot of the time you're waiting for wildlife to happen. and that DJI drone comes in so handy for a locating wildlife. If you're searching a, a large area, you're looking for a large animal like deer. It's really useful for finding the, the deer. Um, and if you're looking for smaller animals, you can use the drone to locate areas where they might be. Going across again, we've got the Sony a7R 4 which is my photography camera. Brilliant resolution on this. It's a really high megapixel count. And although it's not what most people would think of as the ideal wildlife photography camera. I actually really love it because of the resolution. It gives me the ability to crop in without losing quality. Uh, lens, we have the 24 to 70. This is kind of my workhorse lens. This does all of my uh, B-roll where I'm setting the scene, establishing B-roll. And also it comes in handy for some really close up. So you never know, you might get close to the animals and then you can get that shot. Now, up into the junk drawer, bear, Cable, I, I lose these things all the time. So these little cables are really useful to have just chucked in your bag. The Rode Video Micro, which is a little shotgun mic that sits on top of the camera. It's good for scratch audio. It's not the best microphone, but it's good for scratch audio. If you just need something to kind of um, capture the, the ambience of where you are. But if you pair this up with the DJI mic system, now this is a lavalier mic system, but if you pair this up, with this, you can then place this amongst the scenery and capture some 
fantastic audio, which I'm hoping to do today, get some scratching, some crushing nuts and that kind of sounds. And that's just not achievable easily with the bigger shotgun mics. You can put these in places you can't put the other ones. Headphones for monitoring sound. Uh, they don't have to be this big. I use the iPhone ones too. And um, this is a kind of, so now we're on to kind of the, the secrets. So this is a V-mount battery, which I use instead of a power bank. It's actually charging a electric hand warmer at the minute because it is very cold and I'm sure I'm going to need it. Um, this battery will charge my camera approximately. I can probably get six batteries out of this. So what I do is when I'm not using the battery to charge my hand warmer, I'll plug in my battery charger and I'll keep my batteries constantly charging whilst I'm on location. You can sometimes be away for a couple of days, so having this amount of power in your backpack that's small enough and light enough to carry around is really useful. And then the last thing in here is a torch and a good one because nine times out of 10, I'll forget what time it is and it'll be dark by the time I go home. So, so the bag itself is the Low Pro 450 Pro Tactic. The reason I picked this particular bag is because of all of these little clips on the front. They're really good for attaching random things. You can put a tripod through here and uh, like a sandbag or a bean bag on this one, um, which is actually what I'm about to move on to. So bits that don't fit inside my bag, but go on top of my bag. First thing is this uh, sandbag or bean bag. Um, this is the Erdly Creations one, which is from a, another YouTuber. And what you can do with this, just place it on any surface and get your shot that you want to get really quickly. It's really good for quick shots. And then I also have this Manfredta tripod. Actually, I'm not entirely sure as to what model it is. I picked it up a long time ago when I first started photography, but this is probably one of the most imp important purchases I ever made um, just because of longevity. I've had this about 15, 16 years and it's still going strong, still holding on. The uh, head that's on it is the 701 HDV, which is an old fluid head, still doing the trick. I've no need to replace it so far. So. As long as it keeps working, I'll keep using it. So that's enough of what's in my bag. Um, I can see plenty of squirrels around. I, just looking around now, I can see about six. So I'm gonna go straight to the woodland hide and get some shots. So this is the hide we're gonna be shooting from today. We've got three windows on the front here and then one to the side, and they've both got different angle points of view, which means as the light moves throughout the day, we'll be able to get different shots. Okay, so what I've done is I've placed this microphone just here against the screw. It's magnetic, so it just sits here. It's not too big. It does flash, which is a little bit annoying, um, but the wildlife don't seem too bothered by it. And then what will happen is there's a, a bait tray here and as they come up, they'll sit up here or on here, and we should be able to pick up the sounds of them crunching the seeds, uh, moving around, scratching on the post. That's what I'm hoping anyway. And then, so from the hide, that's off to the right-hand side of the hide. And then just down here, down this very slippery slope, here, uh, on another magnet system, just behind uh, the wooden surface here. And then that's gonna be out of the shot. That's the other thing you have to be careful of when you're putting mics in the set is you have to hide them so that you can't see them with your, your camera because they are very distracting. Uh, and with these, you do have to look out for magpies because they do like to take them. So what I'm doing, I'm just setting up the FX30 with the 200 to 600 for the gate where we put the microphone. I've got the receiver for the microphone on top of this so that I'll get a feed directly from the microphone into this camera. And then because the objects where the squirrels will sit are further away on this side, that means that I'm using that extra reach that the FX30 will give me to, to get a little bit closer. Okay, so I'm gonna actually use a spot focus for this particular activity purely because I'm shooting through trees and branches and cameras have a wonderful habit of picking up everything but the one thing you wanted to get. So using spot focus helps me really isolate what I want it to focus on. And then I'm pairing that up with the AF assist on the FX30, which means that if it's not focusing where I want it to, I can simply twist the focus ring on the front of the camera and that will override the focus and then it will come back into auto focus once it's found what I tell it to look for. So you can see on this shot, we've got what I believe is a little chaffinch. Um, so using the log as it comes across, 
you can see that I've split the frame in half and I quite like this effect. You'll see this in a lot of my films. I do like to split the frame because you get nothing but a nice bit of foreground here and no background and then the subject, which I think is a really great way of showing the environment that the animal lives in. And then the touch screen on this allows me to do, literally, I'm quite clumsy, so it allows me to literally poke what I'm trying to focus on. So what I'm doing at the minute is the temptation with wildlife filmmaking and photography is always to just see something, point your camera straight at it and take the picture. And what that does is that takes away your ability to control the shot and the framing and the composition. So what I'm doing is finding an area that I like, finding the separation between the background and the foreground that I like and watching the behavior of the animals to see where they go. Then I'll set my shot, compose my shot and then we'll just wait and it's a case of just watching the behavior. So the squirrels at the minute, I can see are coming from the bottom here, going up this fence post, sitting on top, having a, a hazelnut and then disappearing again. So what I want is that moment they sit with the hazelnut, curl the tail round, and then because of the microphone there, I want that crunching sound as they destroy the nut. Okay, so I'm shooting at 50 frames a second on this to get that slow motion. I keep jumping between 150. So to do that, my shutter speed, I'm using the 180 rule. So my shutter speed is at 100th of a second when I'm at 50 frames. And what that's doing is making sure that I get nice, clean, uh, slow motion, as opposed to sometimes if you've shot it, slow motion at too slow of a shutter speed, it will be kind of blurry. So keeping it nice and clean. I'm at 5.6, which is you know, it's not the most shallow depth of field, but it is, it's, it's shallow enough to keep, create that separation. The ISO, at the minute, I'm at 4000 ISO, which, you know, it's not ideal, but it's, it's what you have to deal with. You can noise cancel later on. And I'm shooting in S-Log3. So using that S-Log3 means I've got a lot of dynamic range, so I can pull back colors from the shadows, I can pull back colors from highlights, as long as I get my exposure slightly overexposed to make sure that I've got a little bit of wiggle room there. So at the moment, what I'm looking for is that iconic shot of a squirrel with its tail curled over its back, sitting eating a hazelnut. Uh, so we've got some out and it's just a case of the patience game. One of the things that happens a lot is you'll see them running around really close to the hide and you'll try and get that shot. But what you'll forget is that the background that you're shooting against isn't ideal. It's, it's gonna be the floor. They're gonna be very close to it. So you're not gonna get any compression. And it, so you might get some cute facial expressions if they're very close, but other than that, you're really gonna struggle to get anything kind of noteworthy from that, that situation. You want the, the further shots and, and really use that compression you get from the telephoto lens. And unfortunately, wildlife is a game of patience. All right, let's head to the reflection pool. So this is a reflection pool hide. Now what it is essentially, it's a giant tray of really shallow water that goes out uh, surrounded by moss and some natural materials such as these logs. There's some heathers at the back there and the rocks that kind of lead. And what it enables you to do is sit level with the water, which is very difficult to do in a natural environment. So just, um, <laughs> James, turn around mate, look. <laughs> Quality. Um, <laughs> so what it enables you to do is get really close and level with the water. So the water becomes like a mirror. So you're gonna get a really nice reflection. Now, when you're composing your shot in here, what you wanna do is split the frame in half, and then you're gonna have half is the reflection and half is the actual event and that enables you to get a really cinematic look to your pho uh, photos and your video. Hi, 
Paul's put out some hazelnuts for us, which is going to lure the squirrels into the positions we want them to be in. So areas like this rock floating just out here, the heathers at the back there, and this runway just here where you can see these birds are. The reason he's done that is to, to bring them in. And baiting as a whole is quite a controversial subject in, in wildlife. Species like red squirrels, we've, we've pushed them to the brink of extinction several times, uh, particularly with the introduction of the grey squirrels in the last 200 years. They, they carry a strain of squirrel pox, which is, it doesn't affect the greys, but it wipes out the reds. So the reintroduction of the red squirrels and the kind of really saving these areas where they're, they're still thriving is so important and they really need all the help they can get. So with the work that Paul does here, he's got a healthy population of squirrels where you can come and visit them. They aren't bothered by your presence. It's such a wonderful experience. So out here, I've got the FX3 with a 24 to 70 lens. I'm actually gonna put this at 24 because they're running straight this way like this. And then they're actually looking at the reflection inside the, the lens. So it's quite a cool little shot. Just used half a hazelnut to balance it there. And then this is the nut that they keep pushing out. I'm just gonna bring it a little bit closer for them. They're running around my feet at the minute. So he should stretch out from here. He's done it a few times. So we'll see how it goes. So just finished up in the reflection pool, all the food has pretty much been eaten, mainly by the birds and then a couple of squirrels have taken all the big hazelnuts. Um, Paul has suggested I give the jumping squirrel platform a go. He says no one's ever tried it with video. They will do it with photography but not video. So I'm going to see how this goes. I'm not promising anything but you know, I'm going to see how it goes. <laughs> So what we're going to do now is we're set up for the jumping squirrels we're on a tripod. Uh, we're going to manually focus this because there's absolutely no way you could have the best autofocus system in the world. You're not going to be able to pull with a speed of a jumping squirrel. It, it's asking a lot from the autofocus. So we're going to manual focus. Paul's going to hold his hand up and I'm going to focus on that. And then that's where this monitor comes in. It's a much bigger display and I can see a lot more of what's in focus and what isn't. And we'll see what the results are. So Paul's going to hold his hand up, which is going to give me something to focus on because we're actually hoping to catch the squirrels in mid-flight rather than just, yeah, that's great, rather than just on a platform because we could easily capture them sitting on a platform, but that's the end of it. We want the beginning and the, uh, the flight, and then we're not too worried about the landing. So one of the biggest parts of wildlife and the bit that no one really talks about is the waiting. Uh, we, there's no squirrels inside, they're still at the reflection pool, so we've just got to wait for them to naturally move over here and start jumping. So it's just a game of patience, which is something I personally struggle with. I get quite fidgety, so being cold, I'm going to walk around a bit. <laughs> yes! <laughs> First time. Uh, so this little squirrel just came across and Paul knows exactly what the behavior is, so he was able to call it out for me, give me plenty of time to get set up and locked on, and I'm pretty sure I got the shot I was looking for. So let's have a look at this. So squirrels have stopped jumping now. We're packing up to go to a new location. The autofocus, actually, it was quite impressive. It managed to lock onto the squirrel when it first got onto the platform. As the squirrel jumped, it kind of lost it, but it picked it up before it landed again. So it is very quick. It's just not quick enough for the jump. So if you're going to do this kind of thing here, I definitely recommend using manual focus. Super successful day with the red squirrels. So I'm now going to head over to try and catch some dippers. 
They live in fast flowing water, so I'm gonna to have to travel to West Burton Falls because Paul tells me I might see some there. So James and I have made it to West Burton Falls. I'm really excited. I've not seen any dippers yet. So what I'm gonna do is get the drone out and do my establishing shots. It's an incredible location. You see, we've got the waterfall, the rapids. It's exactly what a dipper needs to survive. So what I'm gonna do, put the drone up, fly along the river. I'm gonna document this whole area. And the reason I'm doing that is because part of my storytelling style is completing the whole portrait of the animal. It's not just a pretty picture of an animal, or a pretty photo of an animal. It's the entire story of that animal's life is what I'm trying to capture. So a lot of wildlife filmmaking is setting the scene and creating a, a montage of the environment where the animal lives. It's something that I, when I first started out, used to forget about quite a lot. Uh, you get so excited with finding the animal you're looking for, your target species, that you just forget to look around you and document everything that you see. So with wildlife filmmaking, one of the most important pieces of equipment you can have is a good pair of boots. What I want to do is get to this little island here so I can set up just for the falls, just off to my right here. But this water that I've got across is obviously quite deep. And if I was in normal trainers, they'd definitely get soaked and then I'd be miserable for the whole day. So a good pair of hiking boots or something equivalent will really help you out when you get started. So a dipper has just flown in and landed on a rock right in the middle of the river, which is the perfect lighting for me in this time. There's like very little light left. So the only good light is in the middle of the river. Um, so I'm just trying to find it now with a focus is dip behind a rock, ironically being a dipper. Uh, there it is. And I have gotcha. I was in a bit of a hurry to get this shot. So I'm actually in 25 frames rather than the 50 or 100 that the FX30 is capable of, which for wildlife, is incredibly impressive, but when it comes to wildlife, my mantra is get the shot and then get the art afterwards. They're gonna fly, they've flown away, but we're gonna pretend they are aware of they're gone. Hold on, I can hear them. <laughs> Working at longer focal lengths, this is the biggest bugbear of mine, is when they fly off, I've got no idea where they've gone. I know they came this way, but after that, I've got no idea. I managed to get very lucky and I just spotted a dipper. Unbelievably, I was on the wrong side. So when I film dippers, I like to capture the rapids as they're coming down as well. So you can see how the rapids wrap around the rocks and it just adds something to your, your, your moving image, especially when you've got that slow water, you slow it down to the 100 frame mark, you've got real slow water wrapping around the rock and the dipper standing right in the middle of a rock, bouncing up and down. <laughs> Um, it just really adds something to your image. But I happened to be upstream for this dipper. It landed just down the bottom here, which made it very difficult for me to get that rapid look. So I kind of moved around. It hung around for quite some time. Uh, we're a bit late in the day for them to be diving, but it's still a really good shot and I'm really happy with it. One of the things that this tripod is capable of is having the center column out and completely removed and then reversed so that I can hang the camera now, using the uh, collar that the lens comes with, I'm able to hang the camera upside down, but still keep my camera rotated the right way round, which means that I've got a really low angle so I can hover it over the water and create this really dreamy look to the image. It's really great technique, and I uh, discovered it by accident one time when I pulled the center column out too far.
So one of the things I get caught out with all the time because I look and I get focused and I get lost in the world is changing batteries regularly. I'm constantly running out of battery power, um, not because the batteries don't last long, just because I just don't look at my battery meter. So a dipper has just flown past and I've actually missed that shot. So now I'm gonna have to go and chase it so I can get the shot again. So the sun is setting now, which means that obviously we're losing a bit of light, but with the FX30, I actually have dual native ISO. So that means that I can shoot in these low light situations. So whereas before I'd have to close off the day, call it a day because I'm running out of light, I can shoot a little bit longer because of that dual native. Whilst you're waiting for the dippers, I think it's a good time to give you my three top tips for wildlife filmmaking. Tip number one is going to be take a break. Understand that you don't have to put so much pressure on yourself to get the shot. Enjoy your surroundings. Right now I'm sat next to a waterfall in this beautiful area and I've been looking at the dipper. There's a dipper right there. Um, but you know what, I'm gonna take a minute. I'm gonna understand that if I take a break, I'll focus much more when I get to the actual part of taking the shot. Okay, tip number two. Now nah, I've, got, I've got to do it, one second. <laughs> it's right here. Oh, they're scrapping. Oh, it's swimming, it's swimming. God damn it, it's swimming. I'm not gonna get it. <laughs> Come on, camera. Focus, 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 focus. Where am I looking? Uh, where is that? That's over this way, that way. Two dippers, side by side. And we have the shot. So tip number two is going to be be ready for anything. With wildlife, it's completely unpredictable and there's absolutely no way you can tell where it's, what's gonna happen next. So tip two is definitely be prepared for anything. I need to take my own advice and take tip one a little bit more seriously. So tip three is going to be do your research. Understand what the subject that you're photographing behaves like, eats, where they're located, do all your research before you come. The worst thing is when you get to a place where you think there's gonna be a, an animal and it's not there. So do your research, make sure you're well versed in everything about the animal that you are photographing or filming. So I've just seen a dipper disappear just behind that side of the waterfall there. Um, we're at the tail end of the day now, so we're really losing light. But what I'm gonna do is wait five minutes and just see if it pops its head back out again. So I'm now at 12,800 ISO, um, shutter speed of 50, 25 frames. I'm, I'm pushing the kind of limitations of what this camera is capable of to try and get this shot. And we're hopefully gonna see a really nice clean image, but I, I'm gonna set myself up with the expectation that there is gonna be some noise. Oh, they moved there right behind you. Don't move, James. God, that's a beautiful shot. That's such a nice shot. So this is what I was talking about earlier with the compression from the lens and making sure your lens selection is appropriate for the location. There's a, quite a busy background here because you've got the rocks, you've got the river, you've got the waterfall. So all of these individual components and they're gone just like that. <laughs> all of these individual components do create quite a messy, busy background. So by having a longer focal length, you're able to separate your subject and create that isolation that you'll be used to seeing on television. So that's the end to a pretty fantastic day. Both target species, which is a record for me. Normally I only get one, or if I even get one, that's a result. So don't be disheartened if you don't get the results every time you go out with your camera. Wildlife photography and wildlife filmmaking are both a game of luck. A big shout out to Paul and his wildlife hides. Could not have done this video without him. He was so helpful all the way through the day. He gave us some guidance. He's full of knowledge about the red squirrels and any questions you've got, he can definitely answer. And if you want to see any more of my content, head over to drewwebwild.com or drewwebwild on YouTube and you'll be able to watch my videos. I've been Drew working with Wex Photo Video and I'll see you next time. Bye.